All right. All right. Well, welcome. Good evening. This is this is lesson. What did I do? I wrote lesson five. It's Ecclesiastes five. This is lesson seven. How many more do we have? How many more do we have? We have fourteen lessons in all. So we're just about to turn the corner. Um, and that kind of fits. I wanted to put that kind of outline up here again so you see where we're at in the book. And uh, tonight we're going to be talking about false worship. And so we started out, there was an introduction section, and we talked about the brevity of time, and then uh, wisdom's limitation or failure. And then we had the turn, 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 the poem about time. And then we went into this fear God section. Remember the the chiasm structure, this comes to the head and then it repeats, it it goes backwards down this whole thing. So we're we're in the very middle of the book. And so the middle of the book in this structure is, this is the main message. This is the main message of the book, is fear God. And so we started last week in Ecclesiastes 3 uh, we picked it up, you know, we, we said there's a time to be born, there's a time to die, there's a time to gather rocks, time to uh, disperse rocks. And then in Ecclesiastes 3, 14 to 17, there was one more time. You remember what that was? There was going to be a time for judgment of all things. Yes. Okay. And, and there was going to be, so the certainty of judgment, the certainty of judgment after death. And so then he goes into the sections of warnings that we began to talk about last week. And remember what they were? I'm helping you here a little bit. So he warned us about oppression. He warned us about extreme competition. And he warned us about trusting the fickleness of trusting in men and men's leadership and politics. Well, tonight, this, you know, we're going to go right at the heart of the issue here with false worship tonight as we turn into Ecclesiastes 5. And then next week, we're going to talk about warnings against pride and hoarding of wealth or chasing wealth. Again. So this is, the, this, is the meat, this is the core message of the book. Fear God. And then these are specific warnings now of what are these things that in this life under the sun that pull us off course from fearing God. So, uh, so this is this is a warning. So, if you're driving down the strip in Las Vegas, the lights are all flashing, right? The lights are all flashing. Well, the lights should be flashing tonight. The lights on all these should be flashing, but particularly this one tonight. When we were talking about wrong worship, irreverent worship. Um, not irrelevant, but irreverent worship. And uh, so this is right at the heart of the book about fearing God. Um, so let me let me stop there. Any questions so far about where we're at? This is kind of a flyover. Uh, it kind of you know, brings the last couple of weeks uh, together, I hope. Okay? All right. Well, here's your test question. It's always a test. So what's the first commandment given in the Ten Commandments? To, to, to worship God alone and have no other gods before me. Right? Right. So when Jesus is asked in the New Testament, he's asked, what is the most important commandment? And what is his answer? And that and love your neighbor. Uh-huh. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. And you should love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. So the first, the top of the list commandment is get worship right. So think, you know, from the preacher who's writing this book, his perspective. You now, what's the? You know, we've talked about all these absurd, vain things that are going on under the sun. We've, we've seen all kinds of things. We've seen, uh, last week we talked about the, the poor guy that gets out of a prison and supplants the, uh, the old ruler, and then he's supplanted by another guy. And we've seen um, uh, people being oppressed. We've seen all kinds of things going on under the sun. 
But what do you think the most absurd thing is going on under the sun? Man, the creature, is not worshiping God, the creator. This is the most absurd thing going on under the sun. Um, how is it that man, who's created by, in God's own image, is not worshiping the creator? That's the most absurd thing uh, that you can imagine. Uh, I want to start off, and, and let's look at Psalm 101 real quick. Psalm 101, 1 through 3. And this is, a, this is a, a call to worship here. I will sing of loving kindness and justice. To thee, O Lord, I will sing praises. I will give heed to the blameless way. When wilt thou come to me? I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. So this is a, this is a commitment of faith to God and, and a rejection of any other thing in, in worship. So this lesson as we put the, you know, in context of this warning here is the trap, the, the big pothole in the road, if you will, of worshiping anything but God the Creator. And uh, so flashing red lights, right? This is, this is Vegas, flashing lights. So this is the ultimate vanity. And I want you to think about this as we go through this tonight. Step back and think about your own personal worship. And he's going to ask us some questions tonight or, or force us to think about some things tonight. But think about how, to what degree do you revere God as holy? To what degree does God co um, command your attention? How distracted are you when you come to, to worship sometimes? Right? That's a hard one. You got all the kinds of things buzzing in our head. <laughs> But he's going to ask us to think about these questions tonight. <clears throat> to what degree have, when you have made a commitment to God, have you kept it? He's going to talk about vows tonight, and we don't we don't talk a lot about vows, but we'll, we'll get in other than maybe marriage or something. But uh, it was very common, certainly in the Old Testament. Um, God, if you do this, I will do this. Jacob, if you do this, I will worship you as my God. Um, so think about, we're going to think about vows tonight also. All right, so let's read the passage. We're in Ecclesiastes 5, and we'll start in verse 1. And uh, I'm going to read the whole thing. It's only seven verses tonight. So Ecclesiastes 1, 5, 1 through 7. Guard your steps as you go to the house of God, and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know they are doing evil. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven and you are on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For the dream comes through much effort and the voice of a fool through many words. When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it. For he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Do not let your speech cause you to sin, and do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For in many dreams, and in many words, there is emptiness, rather, fear God. So there's a lot here. So look at, look at verse 1 here. This is really interesting. He says, guard your steps as you go to the house of God to worship. And think about where he's been in, in this book, right? And he's talked about all this, 
chaos going on under the sun and all this rebellion going on against God. And yet in verse 1 there, he assumes that man's going to go and worship. So we're created as spiritual beings. We're created to worship. And it's, it, 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 from the Bible's perspective, it's not a question of if you're going to worship. It's a question of who you're going to worship or, or perhaps what you're going to worship. So even, even if an atheist says, well, there's no God, well, guess what? He's probably still going to worship himself. Mm -hmm. right? Is he talking to all mankind or just to the Jews? He's talking to everybody, I think. I think. And so it's, it's not, it's, it's interesting how he starts this off. Guard your steps as you go to the house of God. One way or the other, uh, we're going to worship something. We're going to worship somebody or something. And so the, the, the assumption is that, that as man, you're going to worship something or someone. And he tells, he tells us to guard our steps. That's a that's an interesting way he starts this off here. There's a presumption here that everybody's going to worship somebody or something, and so there's a, that's that's the point of this warning here. Is right worship has got to be at the top of our list. To fear God, we have got to worship Him and Him alone. Guard your steps as you go to the house of God, and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know they are doing evil. Now, think about, uh, uh, so th this is a command to reverence, right? Think about how, uh, and I'll pick on our society, uh, that's what we know best probably, but how much reverence does our culture give God? No, 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 no. What, what are ways that you see God not rev reverenced? Foul language. He's cursed. Foul language. Mm. Just blatant. Um, everything God stands for, yeah. or His word, <laughs> you see being denied. Okay, the denial of, of anything that represents God. And just, yeah, no, yeah, no. I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, I'm just disrespected. Disrespect, God being disrespected. Okay. In our culture, they've taken the word of God and twisted it around to fit their own particular angle, if you will, or desires. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and they're saying, if I have a loving God, which I do because the scriptures say so, then he wouldn't put people in hell and he wouldn't do these things so I have the right to live the way I want. Yeah, so basically saying I can make God be what I want him to be. Yeah, and I can, use the I scriptures can, to prove that. I can make God into what I want him to be. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, uh, the, the the one I, 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 that comes to mind um, is when sometimes people will say in prayer they're talking to the man upstairs. Mm -hmm. Okay. That one always just kind of zings me, right? Because it's a, it's a lack of reverence. He's not a man upstairs. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the God man. I'll, I'll give him that. But the, the idea is that I'm talking to somebody who's an equal to me. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what's portrayed, the man upstairs, okay? But uh, in general, our society doesn't reverence God very much. This is a command to reverence God. Guard your steps, Proverbs 3, 6. Um, it talks about guarding your way. I, I mentioned early on here, there's at least probably 50 direct or, or, or allusions to Proverbs. There's about another 50 or so allusions or direct quotes out of the Psalms. And so a lot of times what he does here is in, in Proverbs 3, like he does in Proverbs 3, 6 when I get there. Proverbs 3, 6. Um, or, um, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. This idea of acknowledging God in your steps. Here. So guard your steps as you go to the house of God and draw near to, what's the word? Listen. Listen. 
listen. What what goes with listening in a relationship? Keeping your mouth shut. Keep your mouth shut, but what look for another word that starts with H. Humility. 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 Reverence and humility before God here. Uh, draw near to listen. Um, I, won't, I won't chase it, but I wrote down Matthew 5, 3 in the in the uh, in the note there. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. All right. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Yeah. Be poor in spirit means to be humble, mm -hmm. to come with a listening heart to God. And and they, like you guys were saying tonight, this is all in direct conflict and opposition to most of what's going on around us today. Yeah. Certainly what was going on in me before the Lord got hold of me. I wasn't listening to him. Um, so, so the idea here is come with reverence and humility. Um, I did want us to look real quick at James 1. Remember, James is the wisdom book in, uh, in the New Testament. And James 1, 19 to 20. I, 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 a lot of times when I'm in a meeting, I'll write this verse across the top of my paper. This you know, my brother, beloved brethren, but let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Slow to speak, quick to hear. And that's what the preacher's telling us tonight. When we approach God to fear him, guard your steps, come with reverence, and keep your mouth shut and listen. Um, uh, 1 Peter 5, 6 talks about humbling ourselves before God. Uh, well, I won't look that one up. Um, it's also up to God here to reveal what's good and evil. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence <coughs> of God. Think about that. Think about your prayer life here. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. Now catch this one. For God is in heaven and you are on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Do we practice that? How well do we practice that? Think about, think, you know, I'm talking to myself here. Think about your prayer life. You know, we'll start rattling off God, help me with this, help me do this. Exactly. Right? We, we, we're looking for what He's going to do for us rather than looking to Him and reveling and admiring His holiness. What was Isaiah's uh, response? Most, most of the people, when they have some encounter with God in, in Scripture or even with an angel, what's their usual, what, what are they, how do they respond usually? Fear. Fear and reverence because of, of the holiness of God and his angels. How did Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, you know, he, he's in the temple and God appears before him, and what does he say? Unclean lips. Holy, holy, undone. holy. I am undone. I'm a man with unclean lips and a people of unclean lips. I am undone. And that's what the preachers tell us tonight. That should be our, our, our approach to God rather than coming in pride and telling God what to do or telling him how he run, how to run things, right? Have you, have you caught yourself in prayer doing that? Where you're telling God this needs to be done, this is how it needs to be? Well, he tells us to watch for that. That's, like, that's human nature, but... Well, exactly, exactly. That's why this is a warning. Yeah. That's why this is a warning. Yeah. This is a warning about how we think of ourselves. You know, we're not God's equal. We're a created being. We're down here in the vanity, in the absurdity of what's going on in the sun. He's on his throne in heaven, sovereign over every detail. 
Well, I'm so glad God has a sense of humor. It is. Uh, I've had some ironic, ironic things in my life where I've said silly things, and, and God has, uh, in His sense of humor, has uh, helped me understand things differently. Yeah. But um, one of the things that I, I wanted to, that goes with this God being in heaven is uh, look at Psalm 50. He's the one that gets to decide what's right and what's wrong. Right? Don't we want to claim that right for ourselves sometimes? Mm -hmm. Certainly our, our culture would. Um, Psalm 50, let me, let me start in uh, verse 3. Well, let me just start in verse 1. The mighty one, God, the Lord, has spoken and summon the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shown forth. May our God come and not keep silence. Fire devours before him, and it is very tempestuous around him. He summons the heavens above and the earth to judge his people. Gather my godly ones to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Now catch this. And the heavens declare his righteousness. For God himself is judge. God is the one who's going to be the judge. He's the one who makes up the rules. He's the creator. He gets to declare what's good and what's evil. That's not our job. It was never our job. But we're sometimes we want to try to do that. That's part of this reverence. He's on the throne. He's sovereign. We've seen this over and over again in Ecclesiastes. He's sovereign. And he's sovereign over what's good and what's evil. I didn't want to uh, chase it here, but all you know, he's reminding us about this idea of discipline and how we approach God and treating him with utter holiness. And I won't take us there, but Nehemiah 1, this is Nehemiah's great prayer, where he prays, he, he, you know, he's praying for, they've told him that the walls are torn down in Jerusalem and his, um, uh, he, he prays this great prayer for God to intervene uh, for the sake of his people. But the reason Nehemiah could pray that prayer because he had this high regard for God and he had this discipline and prayer of coming before God in, in his holiness. He, you know, approaching God in holiness. And I just use that as an example tonight. Um, Isaiah 45. I got you on a, a little Bible adventure here tonight. Isaiah 45 kind of gets to this point too. Isaiah 45, 9 to 11. Those who fashion a graven image are all of them futile. We've seen that word before, haven't we? Vanity, futility, absurdity. Those who fashion a graven image are all of them futile, and their precious things are of no profit. We've seen that in Ecclesiastes too. This is not profitable. Even their own witnesses fail to see or know so that they will be put to shame. Who has fashioned a God or cast an idol to no profit? Behold, all his companions will be put to shame, for the craftsmen themselves are mere men. Let them all assemble themselves. Let them stand up. Let them tremble. Let them together be put to shame. He goes on here and talks about all these different ways that people are, are building idols and calling them their gods here. Um, so the, and I think I read the wrong verse. I'm sorry, 9 to 11, uh, 45. Woe to the one who quarrels with his maker, an earthenware vessel among the vessels of the earth. Will the day clay, here's the point, will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? Or the thing you're making say, he has no hands. Woe to him who says to a father, what are you begetting? Or to a woman, to what are you giving birth? This is his point. We're the, we're the creature. How can we question God the Creator? He's the one that makes the rules. He's in, in sovereignty. He's the one that we need to approach in, in holiness. Verse 3 here. 
Now, some of your versions will probably read different than this. For the dream comes through much effort, and the voice of a fool through many words. What's he talking about? For the dream comes through much effort, and the voice of a fool through many words. Now, where are you reading? This is uh, Ecclesiastes yeah. 5, verse 30. Oh. Anybody have a different version? You want to read? Amazing. You know, this is a little bit. <laughs> As the dream comes, when there are many cares, so the speech of a fool, when there are many words. Okay, this is talking about distraction. <clears throat> when, we, when we approach God, <laughs> if, if, if you ever woke up, you had so much on your mind, you, you, you either couldn't go to sleep or you woke up in the middle of the night thinking about something. <laughs> That's what he's talking about. We've got the cares of the world zinging around in our mind, and, and we aren't thinking about worship of God. We're all we're captivated by all the things going on around us here. Uh, at the same time, you've probably been around people who couldn't keep their mouth shut. They just rattled on. You're probably saying, well, what about you? Uh, so, <laughs> but, but the point here is distraction. The point here is distraction. Um, it's a warning. Um, and, and right, haven't you been sitting in a sermon and your mind's off here and off there or something. And it's hard to track what maybe what's going on in the sermon or you're not trying very hard. The idea here is focus in avoiding distraction when you approach God. And and you know, this is something we all have to guard against. There's so much going on in life. And you know, so what are what are some of the disciplines you use to get focus when you're coming to worship? Maybe even in your own prayer time. Well, depending on what, like for us, for example, YouTube, there's a lot of good stuff on YouTube relative to scriptures and a lot of good pastors on there that you can, and we, Brent and I, uh, watch that a lot before we get ready to retire for the evening. Okay, okay. So the, the, uh, the discipline of of uh, listening to uh, uh, um, preaching or yeah. perhaps godly like music or perhaps or prayer or something, but something something uh, that gives you a marker uh, in, during the day, right? Yeah. And, and perhaps before you go to before you go to bed or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Okay. And many times when we pray, we will reference what we just heard. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Things that you do. To keep you from distraction when you're coming Sing to prayer. Sing a hymn. Sing a hymn. Okay. Okay. When I'm on my way to church driving, I usually play uh, music hymns so that I can. Because when we get up, everybody is going different ways. We have an eighth grader that's that want to go, but he and he didn't lay his clothes out the night before, so he can't find things. And I mean, it's just hectic getting out. Which is kind of funny because that happened to us when our daughter was running. It was hectic to get it out. And we'd get out of the car and people would say, how are you doing this morning? And even though we were like this, we'd say, oh, we're just doing great. Yeah, right. <laughs> that battle to get to church. Yeah, that battle. So, but the point of, of using music or, or something to help you calm your spirit and focus your mind as you come to worship, that's what, he, that's what he's talking about here. This idea of the dreams in the night. Okay, so um, now God does place things on our heart. Uh, Psalm thirty-seven, four, where He talks about where He gives us the desires of our heart. Um, but it, that's and so there may be there may be something God wants you to dwell on. <clears throat> but be you know. So where I'm going here, this this dream may you just got to watch for distractions here. There may be something God's put specifically on your heart that he wants you thinking about. But just be careful here as you're coming to worship the ability to focus on him and not all the other razzmatazz, you know, that's going on around us here. Now, he talks about here, verse 3, he talks about much effort. And I just wanted to make this comment. Um, there's nothing in scriptures that says it's easy to worship God or to read his word or to understand his word. 
there's nothing in Scripture that says this is an easy job to do. That when you get your Bible and you read and you say, well, gee, I didn't understand that. Yeah, like most of us. So you got to dig. you got to work at it. But So I just want to make this comment, you know, that sometimes we flip, kind of flippantly say, well, you know, I guess I, I didn't really understand that in Scripture. You know, I'll just kind of read over that and move on and everything. God's Word is all of God's Word, and it's all equally holy, and it's all equally of our, to our benefit. I just, I just want to encourage you here, you know, to work at it. Worship requires work. Reading scripture requires work um, to put to put much effort into it because he's, he's worthy of that, right? But I just want to make that remark because um, I have heard, particularly new Christians, sometimes will say, "Well, well, I read it. Well, why? You know, how come this book is organized like it is, and why is the language like it is, and why doesn't it read like one of our books?" You know, uh, the, the, in other words, coming to Scripture, that it ought to just be easy to get it, right? That's where a good study Bible comes in handy. And there's a lot of good aids, right? There's a lot of good helps. We've got more, we've got more access to Scripture and more access to helpful things to help us learn than any other generation Absolutely. in mankind. Right? We know less. <laughs> uh, we may know less, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But... I just, I just want to um, encourage you, put much, like, because the, the scripture in verse three talks about much effort here. We put a lot of effort into our work. We put a lot of effort into all kinds of things. How much effort do you put into scripture? That's, that's just a little side comment you got for free tonight. All right, so let's talk about careless worship. And that's what the last part of this is about. I'm gonna read it again. When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it, for he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Do not let your speech cause you to sin, and do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For in many dreams and in many words there is emptiness rather than fear of God. So what about vows here? What, why is he bringing vows up? In terms of properly fearing God. Why is he, why is he bringing vows up? Back in the day when they wanted to they, the, the Jewish nation when they wanted to make a contract, if you will, that's what they used. Okay. Okay. So a vow was um, kind of a covenant. It was a type covenant. of covenant, right? Yeah. right? If you do this, I'll do this. Right? Yeah, it's a con If you contract. do this, I'll do this. And we, and we see that sometimes in the Old Testament. We, we Different characters are saying, God, if you'll do this, then I will do this. Um, what did Jesus say about vows? Remember, Sermon on the Mount? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't make, yeah. Complete, complete integrity. The idea is you shouldn't need a vow <clears throat> that your word should be good, is, is what he's saying here. And that's, that's really what the preacher's telling us here, that we should be compl have complete integrity with God and, I would add, and with men in, in, in worship. So, if you've made a vow of some sort, keep it. Pay your vow. Well, uh, you remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, where he said, "If you, if somebody's got something against you, what are you supposed to do before you cut, uh, worship? Go clear it up. Go fix it. Go fix it. Go take care of it. Go make it right." And that's the same thing that the preacher's telling us tonight. If you've got a vow or some commitment you've made to God and you haven't kept it, you need to clear that up. You need to take care of that. Now, I, you know, we don't talk a lot about vows, but if you've made a vow or a commitment that you haven't kept to God, um, 
that needs to be, it goes to God's reverence and holiness here, right? It's, we shouldn't flippantly say, eh, you know, I just, that's what he's saying. I, I made a mistake. I didn't really mean it. Uh, in verse 6 there, he says, uh, uh, do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. Uh, you know, when the chips were down and I promised God that I was going to do this or that or whatever it was, and God acted and I got off the hook and I haven't kept my vow. Uh, there may be things in, in your life like that, but take, take inventory. That's what I talked about tonight. Take inventory. I've been asking God this week, you know, is there anything that I haven't fulfilled that I committed to, to do? And the Holy Spirit being the Holy Spirit will be very faithful if there is, if there's a problem or an issue here. Um, but ask God this week, is there anything that I've vowed to do that I've not kept? You know, um, clean the slate, if you will. Clean the slate. But the point here is treating God with absolute reverence. If you had a, a friend or something that you loaned him some money, wouldn't you want him to pay you back? No. <laughs> Not necessarily. If it, if you intended it to be a gift, perhaps. Well, no. If, if, but if you loan the money and you, that's what the scriptures say. Don't loan money expecting it to come back. Okay. But what if it wasn't a friend? But what? What if it wasn't a friend you gave you you loaned the money to? Yeah. Uh, I'm messing. I'm messing with you. Yeah, here. But the point. The point being, if somebody make if somebody made a commitment to you, mm-hmm. out of respect for you, you would want them to fulfill that commitment. Yeah. Exactly. That's that's the point I'm getting at here tonight. I was, I was messing with you a little bit. But <laughs> and the sad thing is, if you do loan somebody something, and then suddenly you realize. They're avoiding you because <laughs> they haven't paid it back. They're, they have this guilty conscience. And so your friendship then is. You know, it, can, it can mess the relationship yeah. up, right? Why, you know, most of you have signed contracts somewhere along the line, right? For a house or whatever. How thick are those contracts? Page after page after page after page. Why are they so long? So you'll pay it back. <laughs> so you'll pay it back because other people haven't kept their word yeah. in some circumstance. And so that's why we've got, my son's a lawyer, right? So that's why we've got all these contracts that are, you know, thick as a phone book, right? Trying to plug the loophole. Right? Because they're trying to hold people accountable to treat other people with respect. Yeah. Right? You know what a contract's about? Yeah. This is saying that we should have absolute reverence for God. If you've got something that you need to clear up, you've promised God something, you've made a vow, um, something like that, you need to clear it up. That's what he's saying tonight. Um, and this is this is also, uh, uh, you know, he talks about guarding our word. Some, uh, let me go to Proverbs 13. Uh, 13.3 real quick. Let me look at that. Because the Proverbs talk a lot about keeping your word and guarding your words. The one who guards his mouth preserves his life. The one who wide, opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Be careful with your words. And be careful in your prayers. Right? This, this, I'm, I'm taking you back to prayers here. When you're speaking to God, how much do we talk versus do we listen? I'm, I'm convicting myself here. Uh, but we need to be careful of this and treat God with utter holiness is what he's, he's calling us to do tonight. Um, another part of this warning is in verse 7. For in many dreams and in many words there is emptiness, rather fear of God. How many... Um, I have to frame the question. Um, if you know your American history a little bit, in the last, uh, back, let's just go back to uh, about the Civil War time and beyond. How many cults have come about, uh, major cults, Jehovah's Witness, Mormonism, Christian Science, 
All of these uh, have come within the last 100, 150 years or so, right? In our time, we've got um, Scientology, and, right, right, and the list goes on, right? In many dreams and in many words, there is emptiness. This is a warning about, it, about false worship, about false, right? The more people talk, the more they have get up, can get off in the weeds away from Scripture into false worship. So be careful is what the warning here is. For in many dreams and in many words, there is emptiness. So it's another part of this warning. Any, we, we've kind of zoomed through the scripture. I want to take you to one other scripture before we wrap up tonight. Any questions or, or remarks at this point? Okay. Let me take you to Psalm 19. And I want you to think about this as we read through it in terms of this right worship that the preacher's talking about. And think about the things that we were warned about tonight as, as I read through this. Okay, all right, here we go. Psalm 19.1, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. And there is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from one end to the, of the heavens, and its circuit, remember Ecclesiastes 1, to the other end of them, and there's nothing hidden from its heat. So all of the creation is screaming out God's glory. The law of the Lord. Now, we're going to go from general revelation to special revelation in Scripture. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them thy servant is warned, for we've been doing tonight, in keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. That's what we've been talking about tonight. Presumptuous uh, approach to God. Let them not rule over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord my rock and my redeemer. See how that fits so, so well up against what, what uh, the preacher had to say here in uh, Ecclesiastes 5. So this is a, a, a call tonight, you know. So, so all of us have worshipped false gods in some form or fashion. If you've not trusted in the only God, the Creator, and His Son, the Lord Jesus, let this be the night to, to, to get your worship right uh, on, with God. Um, so a question this week for you to think about. Have you grown careless in your commitment to Jesus? Is your life really characterized by a healthy fear of God? How strong are your spiritual disciplines? We, we talked about some of this tonight. Have you made vows? Have you kept them? How do, how do you approach prayer? Do you listen more than you ask? Uh, do you have a discipline as far as reading and meditation uh, on the Word? How do you approach worship? Do you guard your steps like the preacher said? 
in confession of sin and service and giving, etc. Do you have do you have these as disciplines in your life? Uh, are there vows that you need to keep either to God or other men? And, you know, kind of a general question, are you growing in your knowledge and obedience in His Word? Are you more obedient today than you were a year ago? Are you more obedient today than you were five years ago? Ask the Holy Spirit. He's pretty honest. <laughs> He's pretty honest. But, but what, I'm, what I'm encouraging you to do here is is pray over these questions this week. Just pray over these questions. How do you reverence God in your, in your worship, in your prayer time? That's the question. So, so through tonight, we've, we've been through these warnings. You know, that these are all about how we fear God, getting it, it how we should fear God. The next week, we're going to talk about hoarding and pride and wealth. Is, is the last of the big warnings here. So, uh, but, I, but I would encourage it to, um, as you're reading along here, also pray over these questions. Pray over these questions and ask, ask the Holy Spirit about um, are you reverencing uh, Him as, as He would want you to. So you would say that if you're not worshiping God, <clears throat> You'll worship this something else and profit yourself. Is that right? Yeah, basically, you're worshiping something. Something. Yeah. You're worshiping something. And there's other. Uh, I won't chase them right now, but there's other scriptures, both in the New Testament and in the Psalms, that says basically, whatever you're worshiping, you're going to become like what you worship. Mm-hmm. Right. So that makes sense, right? In the New Testament. It talks about how we're being conformed unto Christ. So the more you worship Jesus, the more you abide in Christ, like the pastor gave in his devotional tonight, the more you're going to become like Christ to the point where Ephesians says that one day we're going to stand blameless before him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what that day is going to be like? Conformed unto him. But if you're worshiping power or get competition which is you winning over everybody else all the time or you're worshiping uh, politics or or somebody a political system or next week we're going to talk about pride and worshiping wealth by can't get enough so I'm going to hoard all the time Scripture says you're going to turn, you're going to become like those things. You're going to, you're going to give yourself over to them. So what the preacher's saying tonight, guard your steps. So think about, think about who you're worshiping and what you're going to become like. If it isn't Christ, you're in trouble. That's kind of the simple message here tonight. But ask, ask the Holy Spirit this week. Is there anything? Is there anything that's not re- properly reverencing God in your life? That's that's the question on the table. Anything else tonight? Okay. Thanks for sticking with it. We're we're, we're halfway through. Just about. We're getting ready to turn the corner. Great Lord, we praise you. We thank you that you are God worthy of all of our reverence. Your God worthy of all honor and glory, every bit of reverence that we can muster. What a great and good God you are. Thank you for your warning tonight, Lord. Help us to walk out of here and to fear you, to fear you and reverence you and and behold your holiness this week. We thank you for these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Dana.